Hi everybody, my name is John Downing and um, I am a limnologist and ecologist and today I want to talk a little bit about stratification and the concepts of temperature and specific gravity. Previous sessions have talked about specific gravity as one of the miracles of water and I'd like to elaborate on that and tell you a little bit about why it's so important and what that means for aquatic ecosystems. So my objectives for today, this um, particular session, would be to have you learn more about the density temperature relationship in water and understand thermal stratification in, especially in lakes or virtually any other kind of aquatic ecosystem, and then learn about mixing regimes, how, how systems mix and when they mix, and then um, learn how dissolved chemicals can alter stratification. Those are my objectives and I hope that they work out for you. There are two important differences between aquatic and terrestrial environments, and um, these are we're going to talk quite a bit about these over the next two sessions. First, uh, an aquatic um, aquatic um, in environment or ecosystem in the, in an aquatic ecosystem, the temperature is pretty cool and stable. That is to say, wide temperature swings are mod moderated, and this is due to the specific heat and also the heat of vaporization of water and um, cooling and heating however are very powerful and you know this um, if you've ever stayed too long swimming in a cool a cool lake and the other important difference between aquatic and terrestrial environments is that the light environment is modulated by water modulated moderated by water it's usually dark uh, relatively dark uh, relative to terrestrial environments and incident radiation can be altered and these will be the topics over the next couple of sessions. Now you will recall that we talked about one very special aspect of water that being its specific gravity or density here showed in, shown in uh, grams per uh, milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter roughly um, and on the x-axis you note there's temperature and we're only over a range of temperature from 0 to 10 degrees um, 10 degrees being rather cool water to go into so that would be something for those of you who do Fahrenheit somewhere in the range of 55 degrees at the upper or maybe 50 degrees at the upper end of this um, of this graph and zero is of course the point of uh, freezing of water and here's a specific gravity and you'll note that it hits a maximum at about four degrees Celsius and that we discussed already in the miracles um, uh, session so you should be pretty familiar with this idea now the important part of this is of course that water that's four degrees Celsius is going to be the heaviest per unit volume of any water in the system and this has very important implications of course for um, for stratification of lakes and ponds particularly so in the summertime there is a thermocline that's formed and a thermocline is an area of very rapid uh, temperature change and you can feel this yourself if you go swimming and dive down kind of deep in a lake and somewhere around 10 meters or about 30 feet uh, in a fairly large lake you should find an area in the summertime where temperature gets quite cool quite rapidly now what this means is the um, the uh, uh, ecosystem is divided into basically three layers or three zones. One uh, is the epilimnion up here, this upper water at the top of the system. The middle system is uh, middle part of the system is where the temperature is uh, changing rather rapidly. That's called the metalimnion, and in the middle of the metalimnion you find the thermocline. And down in the bottom, you'll find the hypolimnion, or the deeper water, hypo meaning under the lake. Hypolimnion be under the lake. Now, uh, also on this figure, you see things called photic zone, aphotic zone, and so on. And we'll get to those a little bit later. But anywhere down in the hy uh, uh, hypolimnion um, in a, a lake system would be called the profundal zone. Anywhere up at the upper part of the uh, metalimnion and the entire uh, epilimnion is what we call the mixed layer and that water is mixing fairly continuously throughout this period of the summer now this is what it looks like in the summer and naturally down here at the bottom the temperature is going to be the water that has the highest specific gravity water with the highest specific gravity is always somewhere around four degrees celsius and in effect it ranges from about four to six 
in deep lakes that I work on in the temperate zone. So um, the hypolimnion is is always around four degrees Celsius in the summer, unless there are period pe there's periodic mixing and warmer water is mixed down into the hypolimnion. The upper uh, mixed mixed layer will be somewhere approaching ambient, but as you know from the heat of vaporization of water, it's probably not going to be up in the high uh, numbers that you see for air temperature. So that's what the thermocline looks like in the summer. And um, now here's what it looks like in the winter. Recall then that um, water with a, um, with a specific gravity uh, with a temperature of about four degrees Celsius has the highest specific gravity of any water that you can have. Therefore, in the winter time, the water is going to be rather um, warmer at the bottom than at the top. You can see in it, this is a temperate zone lake. So here we have ice, ice formation at the surface. We have an epilimnion. It's definitely stratified. It may not be um, terribly strongly stratified in the winter time, but the stratification is held by ice. Here is the metalimnion again in the middle, the thermocline at, uh, here where we have the most rapid rate of temperature change, and then down at the bottom is the hypolimnion. The hypolimnion is four degrees, uh, around four degrees Celsius. Now what that means is actually, if you've been thinking about what you saw in the previous graph and what you see here, Water at the bottom is almost always the same temperature in a deep zone, deep lake in the temperate zone. This is obviously not true for um, for uh, tropical lakes or subtropical lakes, but it certainly um, approaches truth for anyway for um, stratification in the temperate zone, and even in some of the um, well um, in the very high latitudes until the lakes are permanently frozen. Now this is a way that limnologists like to look at temperature data. And here on the x-axis you see temperature. Here on the y-axis you see inverted depth. So basically you can think about this as the top of the graph is at the top of the water, zero, uh, zero meters of depth. Bottom of the water is at the bottom of the graph. Um, and then you see what the temperature looks like when you graph it. So to high temperature up in the 20s, uh, clearly um, a summer-like uh, summer or sp um, late spring or early fall kind of temperature um, curve. But we, here we have the epilimnion. Then we move into the metalimnion, which is the area of rapid uh, temperature change. And then down into the hypolimnion, wh which is the part of the lake that during stable, uh, stable periods does not mix back into the rest of the water column. This is a, a typical way to see a water temperature profile in a way that's quite useful because you can see where the mixed zone is easily, the epilimnion and the upper bit of the metalimnion. Then the area of rapid temperature change somewhere in the middle here would be the thermocline and at the bottom would be the hypolimnion. Now, you might ask yourself how much work it takes to mix a water column and that can be easily calculated with this kind of equation. This was actually put together by a very famous limnologist at the University of Wisconsin in um, the early 1900s and W is the w amount of work that is done when mixing a column of water with a cross-section of A uh, in um, uh, this cross-sectional area of A, which is uh, measured in square centimeters, and a water column length of C, uh, which is the distance. You can see it in the cube over to the right so that you can visualize this. Now D1 and D2 are the densities or specific gravities of the upper surface and lower surface of the water column respectively. Um, so 1D is slightly more dense than the other. Of course my um, balance uh, in the upper right shows that one's heavier. Um, in fact, that is true if the given if the volume is the same. So the densities are simply the um, specific gravities of the upper and lower part of that water column. Now we can fiddle around with this equation pretty easily. Now let's uh, say that we um, we work with the densities now. When the densities are substantially different, of course, you can see that the difference um, will be much higher. Um, and this this will be a bigger multiplier 
of the rest of the equation, which leads to an increasing amount of work necessary to mix the water column. Very straightforward, isn't it? So the greater the curve of change in specific gravity with change in depth, then the higher the stability. That is to say, it takes more work to mix the water column. Um, now, uh, if we're thinking of a, an area of a small cube of water, um, say a few centimeters, or an entire lake, which will be many, many square meters, the lake, um, the bigger number, the bigger the uh, uh, measurement of A, then the greater the amount of work. So a bigger ecosystem takes more work, more energy uh, to mix it, the water column than, um, than a smaller one or a smaller piece of water. Um, likewise, the depth over which you're considering mixing the water column, um, the uh, work increases as the square of that depth. So it takes a substantial amount of more work to mix a, let's say, a, um, a deep uh, thermocline and a deep metalimnion and hypolimnion than it would take uh, to mix a really shallow one. So all of these things go to the amount of work we have to put in in order to mix that system. Now, sort of the uh, inverse way of thinking about that is that the amount of work it takes um, is also proportional to the stability of that, the relative stability of that water column. Some cases we may have a very stable water column, others it may not be terribly stable. And that all depends on the amount of work it takes, which depends, of course, on the rate of, ch uh, rate of ch change in um, a specific gravity of water with, with depth, as well as the size of the system and the depth of the, the ecosystem. Very straightforward equation. You should probably work with this a little bit just to get familiar with it and think about it because it has a great, it's, a, it's really important for, uh, to understand when an aquatic system might mix. Now, before when we looked at the same curve, we were looking at the, not the amount, uh, not the temp, not the amount of work it took, but the actual differences in stability. Um, and this is oh, what, uh, but the, right here, what you're seeing is the work needed to mix a one, uh, one square uh, centimeter water column that is one meter deep, just as an example. And this is um, the temperature of the bottom of the water column where um, we have a rate of change of one degree uh, Celsius per, um, uh, per uh, meter. What you can see from this, I hope, is that uh, you can have extremely high rates of stability or a large amount of work needed to mix a water column when the temperatures are warm. And this has to do with that previous graph that we saw, uh, this sort of accelerating change in uh, specific gravity um, with, um, with uh, temperature that causes, um, uh, that causes a great deal of stability to be um, possible in very warm systems. So you can often find microstratification even in the temperate zone. Um, sometimes you'll have many small thermoclines um, and um, that's because uh, when water is quite warm then um, the differences um, when the, then the differences in, um, in specific gravity for a degree of temperature change is quite large. So this is the amount of work um, and this allows um, allows a great deal of stability even in warm, uh, warm waters with small rates of change of temperature. Here's, um, here we have the relative, um, relative thermal resistance to mixing as a sort of a bar graph superimposed then on the same kind of temperature graph we were um, seeing before and on the x-axis again you have both temperature but also relative thermal resistance to mixing, the RTR measurements. and um, and this is, of course, depth 0 to 16 meters on the y-axis, arranged in the way limnologists like to arrange them. Here you see a little bit of microstratification in the upper waters, um, but where you really see uh, relative thermal resistance to mixing um, is right at the thermocline. So, um, so this, is, um, this is all calculated for layers that would be a half of a meter deep or, or about a foot and a half in um, imperial units. One RTR unit is the density difference between water at 5 and 4 degrees. And this, is, um, this is, shows you 
a one way of determining where the actual thermocline might be. Up here, it doesn't take very much. Uh, it's um, not very resistant to mixing. The water column isn't. But when you get down to the thermocline, it acts like a, a fairly strong barrier. And in diving in lakes, I've actually, um, I've actually been able to see um, the uh, thermocline uh, by particulate matter that sits on it, a particulate matter that falls down and won't drop any farther because it is at the same specific gravity as the thermocline. You can observe these things pretty well. Now there are different ways of discerning the, dis the position of the thermocline and one of them I've just shown you and this is the depth of maximum Bergian stability or RTR relative thermal resistance to mixing and um, that's the middle one in this um, uh, in these bullet points um, and that's that's a very good way of determining the position of the thermocline other uh, easier ways would be to look for the planar thermocline depth this is a position of the maximum rate of change in temperature with depth now this doesn't always imply a great deal of, of stability another way to find it and the way we do this often in the field when we're trying to um, dis determine where the upper mix zone is is to look for the bottom of the epilimnion this is uh, the ch uh, where the change in temperature with depth is greater than about one degree Celsius per meter so there are different ways of doing it probably the best way is looking at the um, depth of actual maximum stability that would be the best thermocline um, unless of course the maximum uh, stability is not high enough to prevent mixing but another way to do it easily in the field is look for the um, look for a place where the change in temperature with depth becomes greater than about a degree Celsius per meter. Now here's an isotherm plot and this is quite important for you to learn how to read and this is a three-dimensional plot essentially what you see on the y-axis again is depth in meters from zero at the top to 12 meters roughly at the bottom and you see dates of course this is prehistoric from 1968 but this is a full year's uh, thermal data from um, Lawrence Lake in Michigan a fairly famous lake it's been studied quite a lot now the dashed line is the position in depth of the thermocline and that's calculated of course and uh, can be calculated in any of the ways we suggested in the previous slide okay now here's a trick in understanding these these are contours of equal um, equal temperature and for example, you can you can see. For example, you can see that uh, here this particular isotherm is a 12 degree isotherm, and what this line descending means is the 12 degree isotherm is descending into the water column and getting deeper and deeper, um, and that happens as you move through the season. Um, and uh, as you move through the season uh, then the water column warms you see some fairly big numbers up here and you get some mixing due to wind and you push down that 12 uh, degree isotherm a trick to learn in understanding uh, how to read these graphs is that when the lines are straight up and down or relatively straight up and down that means the water column is mixing fairly thoroughly when the lines are horizontal that means that the water column is stable and this is a fairly um, uh, well, water column is stable and stratified so vertical lines would mean um, mixing horizontal lines um, would mean uh, stratification and then you can see it toward the end of the season the lines go from horizontal to vertical and that means the lake is mixing again now what this tells you if you've been thinking about it carefully is in this particular lake there are two periods of mixing there's a period of mixing in the spring and a period of mixing in the fall easily discernible here vertical lines and vertical lines in the summertime this lake tends to be very stratified now this has two periods of mixing so it is what is called a dimictic lake it mixes twice per year you may have heard people talk about overturn of lakes um, that's really not right because the water doesn't turn over like the bottom go to the top and the top to the bottom what happens is it circulates from top to bottom so in limnology we prefer to, to talk about circulation periods of circulation or mixing of the water column this is a dimictic lake has two periods of mixing and then fairly strong uh, stratification in the summer with a thermocline at about 0.5 
4 degrees Celsius. A little bit later on in the course, you're going to learn um, that, sorry, the thermocline is not at 4 degrees Celsius, excuse me. The thermocline is at about 4 meters, um, 4 meters of depth, okay? So you can see that by running over to this axis and seeing this number 4 over there. So 4 meters depth, about 12 feet, something like that, um, is where you have, um, where you have a, a thermocline. Now what that means, of course, is, and we'll learn this later when we talk about the physics of lakes, it, it means we can guess that this is a fairly small lake or a lake that's oriented crosswise to the wind or some other factor that would make it mix down deeper. But that we can reserve for another time. Now, um, here are some reasons that stratification and circulation are really important. Stratification provides thermal refuges for organisms um, because it keeps the water cool down at the bottom rather than letting it hit those relatively high extremes, that is to say freezing or let's say 30 degrees at the surface. So it, ke it can keep a cool water refuge. Stratification also isolates sedimentary processes. Pretty important because sediments tend to exude nutrients and other materials. And that means in the summer you can keep clear water because you're not feeding that uh, sediment nutrient material back into the water column. Also, stratification decreases sediment mixing. And sometimes you'll get enough um, wind energy mixed into a lake that it will actually kick up the sediment on the bottom. And so um, stratification keeps that uh, sediment mixing uh, fairly, uh, fairly low during periods of stratification. Another important aspect is sort of the, the inverse of this. Circulation is very important because it releases nutrients and renews hypolimnetic oxygen. You can imagine that once you've established a thermocline, um, the oxygen concentration that's in uh, the um, amount of oxygen that's in the hypolimnion is pretty much fixed. No more oxygen is coming back in. And so um, it can be depleted by decomposition, by other, by various respiring organisms. And at that point, if you kept it always isolated from the atmosphere, unless you have some primary production down there, you're not going to renew the oxygen and things will tend to die. So circulation releases nutrients and renews hypolimnetic oxygen. Also, seasonal circulation drives community succession. Um, you may have noticed in looking at lakes that sometimes you get big blooms of algae, sometimes you don't, sometimes the water has sort of brown kinds of algae in it and so on. It's this a seasonal circulation pattern that makes the community change over the season, uh, and it's driven by nutrients and, um, and, of course, by light and temperature. Now, there are different kinds of circulation patterns, and I already talked to you about dimictic lakes. Uh, dimictic meaning mixing twice. But you can also put the A on the front of it, as here, and make the word amictic. Amictic lakes do not mix, and these are lakes that are usually ice covered all year. Um, you'll see um, in some future s slides that there are some kinds of lakes that are not ice covered that are amictic, but that has to do with chemical stratification. Now, monomictic lakes are those that mix once per year, and we have two kinds of uh, monomictic lakes, and these are cold monomictic or warm monomictic lakes. Now, cold monomictic lakes usually are those that um, will lose their ice cover briefly, warm up slightly so the entire water column becomes four degrees, mix top to bottom, and then regain ice cover. Warm uh, monomictic lakes are usually those uh, lakes in areas where there is a um, typhoon season or a stormy period that um, will change the water temperature um, and the amount of water coming in and the amount of wind. And these are lakes that are usually stratified. You remember that in warm systems, because of the specific miraculous um, characteristics of water, um, we can have fairly strong stratification even though temperature differences top to bottom may be small. And then we'll have an input and a cooling, input of water and cooling and wind mixing. And sometimes these lakes in the tropics will uh, also be monomictic. So we have cold monomictic and warm monomictic lakes. Diamictic lakes are those that mix twice per year. And these um, are usually found in cool temperate zones or high altitude tropical systems that will actually mix twice a year and stay stable the rest of the year. Uh, polymictic lakes are those that mix a lot, um, poly meaning many, um, and um, 
and uh, these mix very frequently or even continuously um, and we're seeing a lot in the even in temperate zones seeing a lot more polymictic lakes than we used to simply because the climate is getting warmer and actually uh, seasons are becoming stormier the final kind of circulation pattern we see in lakes would be oligomictic lakes and oligomictic lakes rarely mix they're usually very warm lakes with strong stratification and only rare stormy periods or in some cases they may be um, chemically stratified lakes that only mix when there's a massive amount of energy input those are the various kinds of mixing regimes that I'd really like you to learn and understand now if you look at the geography of thermal lake types we've already talked about this really um, but um, there is an effect of depth of course and altitude of latitude sorry and um, deeper lakes of course tend to mix less because you're dealing with a much longer uh, taller water column that you have to mix top to bottom and um, as we move through various latitudes here's um, 40 degrees latitude actually um, as I'm recording this I'm in the state of Iowa which is just a little bit north of this um, of that 40 degree mark um, that's sort of the area, sort of on the boundary between sort of where we get warm polymictic lakes and cold polymictic lakes. Um, and that has to do with temperature and the strength of stratification. In warm areas or in sort of low latitude uh, zones, um, the, uh, when the lakes get deeper and deeper, they tend to get to be discontinuous warm polymictic lakes because it takes more energy to pour in there in order to mix the system or we may move into warm monomictic lakes which again are those that will mix um, when there's a big storm or a cooling period often uh, associated with monsoons over at the left hand side here we see the higher latitudes these are cold polymictic if very shallow but mostly dimictic if they have substantial depth and once we are moving into the very high latitudes up at 70 75 degrees north then um, we will see some cold monomictic lakes and this depends on the lakes um, uh, be, uh, becoming ice free for some period of the season and then when we get farther north lakes are usually um, very um, are, are usually ice covered and um, so so will be amictic this is a figure from the CALF book actually this is redone for the new book that will be coming out I hope um, if, if it has not already done so now here's um, here's an isotherm plot for a cold monomictic lake this is Moretta Lake in Northwest Territories of Canada and here you can see at the top the ice cover is substantial ice covers a meter and a half of ice and it's the system is quite cold except when ice cover is lost and then the temperature moves up to it mixes after ice cover is lost and um, and the lake mixes top to bottom and then begins to have very intermittent mixing and then regains ice cover again in, in which case it's stratified for the winter again you can tell periods of stratification by the relative degree of horizontal lines or vertical lines vertical lines being mixing and relatively horizontal lines mean um, stable or stratified here's a warm uh, monomictic lake in the um, uh, this is Lake Kinneret I think which is I think is called sometimes the Sea of Galilee um, and now you the uh, numbers are quite fuzzy I'm sorry on this particular plot I uh, maybe made it a little bit too big being overzealous uh, helping hoping to help you be able to see um, but uh, the numbers up in this region are at like 27 and 28 and you know already that because of the heat of vaporization of water high heat of vaporization of water we're not probably going to go much higher than about 30 so this is about as warm as you get in the world um, and what you see here is a stormy season in January or February in which case the lake will mix top to bottom and gets quite cool it's replaced by a period of um, a period of stratification with the thermocline descending as the season progresses um, and this is a little bit confusing the depth over here this is height um, depth below sea level so um, this entire lake is many meters below sea level um, in uh, which is very odd but it's also a very salty sort of lake and so we've we've got stratification at some depth 
oh somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 meters descending down to uh, descend, descending down to about 20 meters and then in the stormy season uh, this is a warm monomictic lake and so stratification is lost so we might think about surface temperature and surface temperature um, varies seasonally and it varies seasonally as a sort of a sinusoidal function of the average air temperature and the semi amplitude of the average air temperature so it's a, a basically a, a looks like a sort of a sine curve but more or less pronounced depending on where you are in the world clearly if you're down around the equator down this is Lake Albert in Uganda it's a one degree north of the uh, of the equator there is not much seasonal variation and temperature at the surface is almost always constant here we have a lake at uh, 41 degrees north I think uh, this is Oliver Lake uh, I think is in the state of New York um, and so you can see here the temperature gets actually quite high at the surface in the summer and very low uh, of course in the winter time uh, moving north more northerly we still get some pretty high temperatures in the summertime but extremely low temperatures in the winter time until you get to something like Char Lake at 74 degrees north and this would be um, probably a cold monomictic lake um, you get a little blip in temperature uh, sometimes in the summer sometimes it will stay frozen all winter likewise you simply invert everything when you move um, move to the southern southern latitudes um, invert these sinusoidal curves bottom line on this is that the temperature can be predicted at the surface pretty well um, and um, it uh, in, even in the temperate zones and very high latitudes will often attain quite high temperatures and the difference would be um, differences among these um, periods of stratification would be the temperature and duration of low temperature um, uh, in the cold uh, cold period of the year that is the winter time when ice cover is probably attained so a question that's often asked is when might we uh, expect lakes to stratify and I this is uh, the purpose of showing you this graph are, are, well purposes are a couple of things one of them is to show you that it can be kind of fuzzy a uh, kind of a relationship uh, on the y-axis you see stratification depth date and on the um, x-axis the mean annual air temperature um, but you also see a quite a difference between dimictic lakes and monomictic lakes now as you move um, these are pluses up here those are dimictic lakes and in, you'll have a lot of dimictic lakes until you get to a mean annual air temperature of about eight degrees celsius then you begin to have uh, monomictic lakes of the sort of warm monomictic variety and um, the um, stratification date may in fact get rather fuzzy bottom line on this is that as long as we're in a dimictic system in the temperate zone we can predict the stratification date but it's driven by temperature so you can think what would you expect based on climate change would these things be changing and you know the answer is for a given latitude of course um, as uh, temperature warms they will tend to have an earlier and earlier date at which ice covers lost and stratification is attained for the summer period now I mentioned a little while ago the depth of stratification uh, we were looking at Lawrence Lake and said okay that well stratifies in the summer at about four meters um, and so I said well, it's a pretty small lake this see, shows graph shows on the x-axis this is from work by Michelin Hanna um, back in the 1990s where she shows a maximum effective length in meters um, a thousand being a kilometer uh, this being 10 kilometers and 100 kilometers over here uh, so very big lakes um, essentially the depth epilimnet, epilimnetic depth or planar thermocline depth tend to increase as the lake gets bigger and these are in meters so I said a little bit earlier that in lakes of a moderate size you can expect to find a thermocline at around 30 feet or 10 meters and that would be for a lake of a kilometer to 10 kilometers in size clearly in large lakes um, and lakes like um, lakes like Lake Superior for example uh, uh, which are very deep well in Lake Baikal in Russia being uh, sorry extremely large they will have very deep thermoclines epilimnetic depth is um, uh, tends to increase as lakes get bigger um, and um, and little lakes uh, stratify at a shallower depth 
There are lots of models for predicting depths of thermoclines, and these are just reviewed here. But what I'd like you to see from this are the variables that tend to drive the depth of thermocline mixing. These would be the Z here. Z for limnologists is almost always, um, or Z as I would normally call it in Canada, um, Z is um, the depth almost always. And uh, um, Z sub T and Z sub mixing are the thermocline depth and the thickness of the mixed zone. Um, so those are uh, the variables we're trying to predict. A in the, um, on the right sides of those equations is the area of a lake. MEL is the maximum effective length. F is fetch, and that's how far the wind can work on the water. And MEW is the maximum effective width. What you can see from this is the depth of the thermocline is a fairly uh, clear function with some predictability of the size of the ecosystem you're discussing. Now, the last kind of lake I want to look at here is lakes in which a, a layer doesn't mix um, at all, and these are meromic meromictic lakes. Now, meromictic lakes, had, uh, the layers are called something different. The upper layer is called the mixolimnian, and instead of being separated from the bottom water by a, hype, by a thermocline, it's it is separated by a chemocline, and below in what we would normally call the hypolimnion, is, um, that water is called the monomolimnion. Now, ectogenesis, well, there are various kinds of meromixis, and um, they are um, formed by different kinds of processes. Ectogenic meromixis would be when external sources of saline water flows in and creates that monomolimnion, or very stable layer down at the bottom. And we see this often with road salt drainage, with mine drainage, and so on, where very saline water flows in from the outside. Crenogenic meromixis is a uh, meromixis that's evolved from saline springs and their activities. And biogenic or endogenic meromixis is where intense biological activity liberates various kinds of salts in lakes and creates an area that is relatively stable um, due to the production of salts from the inside. They're endogenic. And um, these usually require something like shelter or calm meteorological conditions in the spring that allow maintenance and enhancement. And I've seen some of these lakes in um, northern Minnesota, where I work frequently, um, and where lakes are crosswise to the winds, very small and quite deep, you'll often find uh, endogenic meromixes. Now, meromictic lakes can have temperature inversions, okay? So the, the theta that you see in these graphs, or the solid lines, theta is temperature. And what you see in this big soda lake, um, a, a, a lake with some fair depth, um, we see that the temperature declines in the normal fashion until you get down around the chemocline. Then it begins to warm up in the bottom. And this is because stability is not simply driven um, by temperature, it's driven by salts. And here you see the chloride concentration. You can see it's very salty in the, in the bottom waters and relatively fresh in the surface waters. Likewise, here's Lake Sinmayo um, in, um, um, Sinmayo is in um, Japan. And here we have chloride concentration, a chemocline somewhere in this area, and we see warming beneath the chemocline, even though the surface waters tend to cool as we decline in the relatively fresh waters at the surface. And here we see total solids. This is Ritam, which is shown in the uh, figure below. This is a, an alpine lake. This is crenogenic meromixis, where there are saline springs. And you see total solids, chemocline about here. And then here we have uh, very cold temperatures actually at the bottom, but they can show temperature inversions. Mono Lake is one of these lakes that shows a, a, a lot of salinity and tends to be uh, meromictic. Um, and sometimes we have meromixis that are, generates um, murderous uh, conditions. And we see uh, this especially in volcanic regions where we'll create a meromictic lake due probably to something like crenogenic meromixis, saline springs from volcanic sources causing salt, um, salt layers to get very high. Oftentimes um, there's a great big, uh, very large buildup of carbon dioxide, methane, uh, sodium, sulf uh, sorry, hydrogen sulfide and other gases down in the monomolimnion. And sometimes due to gas bubbles uh, bubbling up to the surface or other factors, they will invert uh, 
and mix, releasing all these gases. And they can be actually quite deadly for people and livestock, as is illustrated um, in these images. Pink Lake Australia is another one of these lakes. You see it's pink because it has purple sulfur bacteria in it. This often lives in, um, in very saline aquatic systems. Now, I'd like to talk extremely briefly about marine systems because stratification is slightly different in marine ecosystems. Now, um, uh, we have uh, temperature on, this is a graph uh, in kilometers, not in meters anymore. Um, and this is, um, this is a graph of temperature and uh, salinity uh, in the deep oceans. And often because of influx of water at the surface, that fresh water doesn't mix with the rest of the ecosystem. And we have a surface zone that's characterized by um, fairly warm temperatures, but also um, by uh, relatively low salinities. And the uh, bottom uh, waters are characterized, of course, by very cold temperatures and uh, relatively high or ocean-like salinities. These two layers are then separated by the, the pycnocline zone, uh, which can be really broad, where there's a change in salinity, gradual change in salinity, salinity and temperature. Stratification is central to mar the marine hypoxia problem or the dead zone problem that you may have heard about. Um, and basically what happens in this um, scenario is you have a pycnocline here. Uh, surface waters are separated from the bottom waters. Um, and um, nutrients flow in here, causing algae to grow. Um, and the, the algae uh, falls down underneath the pycnocline where there's no new influx of oxygen. It's blocked by the pycnocline and uh, that organic matter can decompose using up all the oxygen and causing mortality of important food fishes and other biota. My summary for session four is simple. Uh, again, water has its greatest specific gravity at about 4 degrees C. Lakes stratify into an epilimnian, a metalimnian, and hypolimnian when they are stratified by temperature, and they're separated by a thermocline. And you can predict pretty much where this thermocline will be based on the size of a lake. Lakes tend to mix never, uh, once a year, a couple times, or many times per annual cycle, depending on where they are and what the temperature is and what the salinity of the water might be. Dissolved salts can also result in stratification into a mixolimnian and a monomolimnian that's separated by a chemocline. Um, a combination of thermal and haline stratification uh, it, uh, comes together to create marine pycnoclines and also is important in understanding the uh, marine hypoxic zones of the world and the stability of marine uh, stratification.